Hello and welcome to today's Mind Your Career webinar. My name is Adam Sylvain and I work with the Alumni Career Development Team here at the University of Chicago in Hyde Park. I'm delighted to welcome you to our webinar entitled LinkedIn for Job Searching, Networking and Career Building. Today we'll hear from alumna Anne-Marie Siegel. Anne-Marie is an executive coach who partners with board candidates, attorneys, senior executives and other professionals to facilitate career transitions, advancement, leadership, interview preparation, resume writing and personal branding. She is the author of two career-related books, Master the Interview, A Guide for Working Professionals, and Know Yourself, Grow Your Career, The Value Proposition Workbook. Anne-Marie is a member of the Forbes Coaches Council, writes on career and resume topics at Forbes.com, and has been quoted on CNBC.com, Monster, Above the Law, and other media outlets. She holds a JD from NYU School of Law, an MA in Art History from the University of Chicago, and a BA in Fine Arts from Loyola University of Chicago. Without further ado, it's my pleasure to cede the floor to Anne-Marie for today's presentation. Are we, am I here? Can you see me? Here I am, great, welcome. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for LinkedIn for Job Search, Networking and Career Building. As Adam mentioned, I'm Anne-Marie Segal, and I did live in Hyde Park. My parents were actually born there. Um, now I live on the East Coast in Connecticut. And I'm, I thank you very much for joining us for this hour. Um, as I mentioned to Adam, just, just before we join the call, I'm not going to be able to make you a LinkedIn expert in an hour. My goal is twofold. One is to really help you become more comfortable with the platform, and the other is to give you insight into different ideas that may be helpful for you to start thinking about that you may not have known about LinkedIn so that you can explore them further. I do have other seminars. You can certainly visit my website. It's just my name, annemariesegal.com. Um, and I'm not going to talk more about that now. I'd like to just jump into this seminar. So if you have the handouts, um, there should be a link to all of the different handouts. I believe there are four. Is that right, Adam? Um, there are actually five, yep. And those oh. handouts can be accessed from the, the handouts tab on the control panel. Great. And so. We can go through different parts of those handouts at various times. There is an article, 15 Ways to Boost Your LinkedIn Profile. That's a good place to start, um, especially if you're not even on LinkedIn. They're, they're good things to think about. But also, I notice one of the things that happens with LinkedIn is we spend time focused on a certain area, and I'll talk about this further, and we don't necessarily think about all the different ways that, that you can maximize or leverage LinkedIn. So that's really what we're here to do today. So LinkedIn, just a bit about it. It's, it's the most powerful online tool. I'm, I'm assuming most of us know that. Um, many, many professions rely on it, both for recruiting, for connecting, and for building a, a, a credible presence online. Often when you're searched, it's one of the first things that comes up about you, unless you have a large on, online profile other than that. Um, some fields, of course, are less on LinkedIn. Um, I actually went this morning to the hairdresser, of course, doing a webinar, and she was even excited to hear about LinkedIn. So it's it's really ubiquitous at this point. Everybody's using it for different purposes. Um, in the handouts, one of the things that I, one of the handouts is essentially different types of ways that you can write a profile. And for someone who's an entrepreneur, I just want to mention that can be a bit different if you're looking at clients versus someone looking at job search, but many of the concepts are the same. So how LinkedIn fits in, and we're going to take a poll in just a moment, but I'd like to essentially give you a sense. When I talk about LinkedIn, often people say, oh, it's, it's, just, a, it's just an online service. It doesn't really fit in in the larger sense in your career. And I wanna give you a sense of how that is actually not the case. LinkedIn's larger than that. Vision and direction. So these are what I call the, the four main spheres of career building. In vision and direction in that sphere, I'm thinking about how you think about your career, how you imagine it. And because we have such access to many people that we didn't before, um, through our connections, through um, our ability to research on LinkedIn, LinkedIn can actually help you form a vision for your career. It also is helpful to organize your contacts to optimize your job search if you're using LinkedIn and possibly Google, where in Google, if you're not familiar with this, 
you can search many, many job sites all at the same time. So there's an idea of essentially being more effective in your job search, and so LinkedIn fits into that piece. Obviously, presentation and branding. LinkedIn is the place where you either are generating leads or looking credible to people who are invariably going to look you up. And the numbers I hear are, are generally 90% of recruiters and 75% of hiring managers go to your LinkedIn profile if you are going to have an interview or if they're considering your application. So it's really something that we all need to be thinking about. Sometimes if you don't have a LinkedIn profile, that can be a negative. And people wonder what you're hiding. Um, it may or may not be fair, but that's how it's often viewed in the, in the modern job search. Career, um, in that presentation and branding, the networking and career-related communications obviously are there. Many of us network through LinkedIn, find people through LinkedIn, and try to make connections that way. And finally, thought leadership. LinkedIn is a place where you can either create thought leadership or um, spin out other thought leadership that you have created in other places. And again, we'll talk about that further. So Adam, maybe you can start our first poll. Absolutely, um, I'll launch that now. First question is, how often do you use LinkedIn? We've got five options here, three plus times per week, one to two times per week, once per month or less, only when I update it or almost never. So we'll give our audience just a few seconds here to record their responses and then I'll be happy to share those out. All right, looks like we have most of our responses in. We'll just give it a couple more seconds for the last few on the call to, to offer their responses, and then I'll, I'll share those with our audience. So I'll, I'll ask you again when I finish with this slide so we don't um, take time on that. Why LinkedIn matters? And, and again, here I wanted to give you a kind of an overview of all the things that happen through LinkedIn. Recruiting and job search tool, obviously. Um, there's ATS, and, and um, we'll talk about that further. Lead generation and credibility, as I mentioned. Really getting a, your presence out there online and making sure that people know who you are and why, why they should care is how I usually say it either why should I hire you or why should I connect with you? Why, why, how do you fit into my life, essentially? Um, it, it can be a platform used for research, networkings, and then as a Rolodex. And I want to make a, a note about that. In the LinkedIn Terms of Service, they can shut down your account at any time. So if you are using LinkedIn as a Rolodex, and I know I date myself with that term, but if you're using it to keep up with your contacts, you can actually download all of your contacts. You can also download your profile, and I suggest you do both of those from time to time because you can be suspended. It has happened um, for various reasons to different people I know. Um, and so you want to make sure that you have access to your data. So go ahead, Adam. What's our result on the first poll? Sure. Um, yeah, so we had 45% of our respondents said that they um, are using LinkedIn three plus times per week. Uh, the second most, 26%, said one to two times per week, 12% uh, once per month or less, 9% only when I update it, and 8% almost never. Got it. Okay, so many people in this seminar, uh, webinar are actually using LinkedIn a lot. Um, so I, I'm glad to know that, and I'll definitely speak to that. And then I do see there's a 8% a significant minority that are almost never on it. So we want to think about that as well and how um, how their what their LinkedIn strategy should be. Maybe it will even come up in the questions at the end. So and here's some more data and and I wanted to present some important points that we get from this data. You know, it's not just oh how impressive there's 590 million users. The number of active users in the US and in general is very high. Um, the decision makers strikes me as well, 11 million of the 40 million decision makers, so people in hiring roles and you know hiring, whether they're your client or in a job search, 11 million millennials. So when we think about, and I'll talk about straddling in a later slide, like thinking about um, having different types of audiences, we want to think multi-generationally multi as well. 
regardless of what your generation is, that you're appealing to a wider audience. Um, Adam, we had a couple more. We had one more poll here. Am I right? Yes, we can uh, launch our, our second poll question. Great. Um, all right, and that uh, next question is, what is your current job search status? Um, and our options here are actively searching for new opportunities, not actively searching, but interested in new opportunities. I might be interested in a new job soon, but not right now. And I like my current role and I'm not motivated to job search. What I'll say as people are doing this poll, um, what I often say to clients is, in this world, we're kind of all always in a job search, meaning it's not like back in the day, um, your father's, you, you know, your own, your father's, your grandfather's, whatever generation where we had jobs for many, many years and didn't really change. Now the expectation when you hire someone, maybe if you hope they'll stay three to five years at least, and if it works, maybe longer. Um, many people are what used to be called job hopping, changing jobs much more often. So obviously this question is really, are you currently looking in, a, in an active way or are you kind of open to it? But I want to suggest at this point and, and later in the presentation as you're thinking through it, even if you don't consider yourself in a current job search, and in, I know it takes a lot of energy, but think of how you can actually always be not always on, but always be ready. So kind of always know where you are and, and what your value is so that at any moment, the right opportunity comes up, you're ready for that. Do we have, um, do we have some results yet? Yep, I can share those results now. Great. Um, so we had 54% uh, of our respondents that said they are actively searching for new opportunities, 30% that are not actively searching, but interested in new opportunities. 11% that may be interested in a new job soon, but not right now, and 5% that like their current role and are not motivated to job search at the moment. Right, right. I don't see, oh, I do, okay, great. I was going to say, I may have a cat here in the background. I have some animals with me today. <laughs> so hope, hope, hopefully it doesn't make any noise. Um, okay, so we're on to artificial intelligence and machine learning, and this is really one of the things that people who are not active even if you're active users of LinkedIn, not, not actively following what's going on with LinkedIn, this is something that might be a bit of a revelation to you. Um, everybody knows, of course, that they're using our data, right? I mean, that's why a lot of people may not even want to put a lot out online. You have no idea who's using it or how and how they're measuring it. Um, with the artificial intelligence and machine learning of LinkedIn in particular, what they are doing is finding what candidates they may want to to match to certain roles so that when recruiters or hiring managers are going on sometimes they are sometimes they are actually formally posting a position because they have some requirement to do that but before that even gets going they are essentially going and figuring out proactively who are the candidates they want to recruit and it could be that they're using and i'll go through some of the different search terms that they're finding you know different ways that they want to slice and dice people based on that data from the artificial intelligence it could be that and this is a really interesting thing i didn't know existed until recently they can find a profile that they like and they can set a search that they want to find other people who look like that profile if you can imagine so that's that's how much um, evolved this artificial intelligence and machine learning has has come on if you're not familiar with the concept of machine learning essentially that's like the, com the computer getting smarter or the algorithm getting smarter more more importantly and so when you are active on LinkedIn the different types of activity that you have LinkedIn is tracking it and so you can say you're interested in one area but if all your searches are in another area that, that conflicts essentially with your profile then it kind of messes with the algorithm in the sense that you're not giving it consistent information. So if you are looking to match to a certain type of role, it's helpful to have activity on LinkedIn, um, which is one of the reasons to do your job searches there, um, but also to have kind of everything match and line up. I know that's hard to do if you have various interests, but think about the concept at least so that you can um, try to apply it to the extent you can. 
I'm trying to go to the next slide here. Let's see. There we go. Um, and so want ads that want you, a continuation of that. Open candidates, which I'll give you some details about, is a powerful feature on LinkedIn. If this is something you're not familiar with, I suggest you really learn about it. Um, it's something that, it, it's called a green light, essentially, it's the way they think about it, that you're open to a job, um, you're open to changing. You can put it on, sort of put your green light on in different ways. Here, let me go to this slide just to talk about it for a moment. Um, so, so um, we go, where is it on here? Let recruiters know you're open. And then you have different levels where you can say essentially that you're act it's kind of like our first poll, right? You're actively looking or you are um, just kind of open to new opportunities. And so e even if you are open to new opportunities, it doesn't mean that you're necessarily ready to leave your current employer. And I talk about this subtlety with clients all the time. There is the possibility that your current employer, especially if they have different affiliates, and some of those are in the recruiting industry or just kind of have this software and they can look for you, because it doesn't share it with your current company, but it shares it with an affiliate possibly of an, under a different name if they have a different subscription. So there is that way and other ways that someone might find out that you're in a job search. You can still use open candidates. You just want to dial it back and not necessarily be saying that you know you're out there and ready to move right away but at least you have that quote green light on and then if i go back to here that's where the candidate spotlights come in these are ways that recruiters can set their searches so is does this candidate you know or i'm looking for candidates who and maybe with other search criteria are open are likely to respond based on that ai and ml um, artificial intelligence and machine learning. They have connections at the company because it's assumed that you're more likely to be a fit, you're more likely to know people, um, you're more likely to come if you have connections at the company, if they do try to recruit you. Um, if you're engaged with their brand, essentially you're liking things they post or um, going on their pages, things like that, that's the machine learning. And if they can search by past applicants. So someone who showed continued interest in the same company, they might decide that that's a positive, and so they want to search people in that way. And then I've, I've quoted an article, again, if you'd like to look at more. Um, essentially, this is um, how LinkedIn in, in, gathers this sorts of information and how they use it. It also, another change that LinkedIn is making, and they're still in the process of doing that, but they've made a lot of progress, is something called Recruiter System Connect. So Recruiter System Connect integrates the, the actual LinkedIn profiles with a number of the ATS systems that companies are using. So recruiters don't even need to go onto LinkedIn and import a profile, it comes directly into the ATS. So you can see how powerful this is. I've talked a bit about open candidates. I do want to mention, I say a couple of things on the side, don't, many people, um, when they're open to a new opportunity, want to know if they should state that directly on LinkedIn. I'm in the Resume Writers, uh, National Resume Writers Association and some other associations where, where we, we talk about this. Um, we essentially all agree. Um, not that, you know, we're the industry, it's not that we, we have the corner on it, on it but um, essentially open to new opportunities not a good idea. And I have Robert Hellman's article below that talks more about that. If you're open to new opportunities, that's where you turn on open candidates. Um, if you say you're open to new opportunities, it's almost like, first of all, you're wasting space. You're not using keywords. You're not telling people your value prop. And it also can come off as a bit desperate. Um, and so it can turn people off. The other thing is a suggestion not to take all open invitations to connect. Mm. And Robert Hellman mentions this as well. Different people have different ideas about this. It used to be that there were what's called lions, these LinkedIn open networkers, and it was something that a lot of people did. They're finding that they have many more connections than they can actually have meaningful relationships with. And they're also finding um, at times that if they're connecting to people all over the map, and, and I don't mean that you should not connect with people you actually know, that you should just be niching yourself. But if you're getting random connections from all over the world, be thoughtful about who you're connecting with, or even, even all over the country, even all over your city. But in general, be thoughtful. 
um, lead generation for job search candidates. And Adam, I think we had two more poll questions here. Yep, um, I'll be happy to launch the, the next poll question. Um, this one, how comfortable are you with using LinkedIn? So a good time to uh, kind of state whether you are completely familiar and meaning you know most or all of the features are pretty comfortable. Uh, you know all the basics, somewhat comfortable. You might know a few things, not comfortable. You have it, but don't use it often or completely unfamiliar. Maybe you're not even on the platform at this time. Looks like we've got most of our uh, responses in, so I'll be closing the poll in just a moment here and can share out those results. Well, why don't we, can we launch the other poll first and then share them both? It actually has to go one at a time, so I'm closing this one now and I can I can okay. share that out here. So this, uh, this last poll, we have 44% um, that consider themselves pretty comfortable. They know all of the basics. 39% um, that are somewhat comfortable, they might know a few things. 9% um, that are not comfortable, they have it, but don't use it. Um, and then 6% that would say they're they're completely familiar, know most or all of the features. And then just 1% that, that would say they're completely unfamiliar. Right, and Adam, as we talked about, part of the reason we're doing these polls is to help people know um, they're not the only ones who are using LinkedIn. I mean, everybody, every professional that I talk to, as I mentioned, even you know, my hairdresser this morning, um, wants to know more about LinkedIn and how to use it. Um, it's, it's ubiquitous across fields, across um, countries now. I, I wouldn't say every country necessarily, but you know, people all over the world are using it. And everybody wants to know how to use it better. So I think it's helpful to know that. And oh, Adam, we were gonna ask at the beginning where people were from, maybe we could, Ask them to type that in the chat box. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll launch that that last poll now. And um, as you're responding to this poll, if you can also um, respond in the questions box and just let us know, yeah, where you're joining us from today, um, I'll be happy to share kind of both those things out here. So, um, so our last poll question: um, What what do you use LinkedIn for most often? So your options here: updating your profile and experience, job searching, networking with other professionals engaging with thought leaders in your industry or sharing articles and career accomplishments within your network. So if you can respond to that poll and then when you finish, if you can go into the questions box and also just uh, share with us in, in just one word um, where, you're, uh, where you're joining us from today. All right, so I, have, I do have a few people that have, have uh, told us where they're joining. So we've got um, New York City, um, Chicago, Massachusetts, um, Greenwich, Connecticut, Washington, D.C., the Bay Area, um, Columbus, Ohio, Denver, uh, all represented, Michigan, um, Texas, L.A. So lots of, uh, lots of variety in, in where folks are joining us from today. So great, great to see that. Great. So far, all domestic. Yeah, that's what it looks like. If there are any folks joining us internationally, um, now would be the time to, to let us know. That'd be great, great to know. And I'm going to close the, the current poll and share out those results. So that, um, again, the question is, what do you use LinkedIn for most often? Our greatest response was 37% that said they use LinkedIn for job searching. 32% uh, said they use the platform to network with other professionals. 27% um, that uh, use LinkedIn most often to update profile and experience. And then 2% each for engaging with thought leaders and sharing articles and career accomplishments. Great, good, good. I'm glad to know that, that there's a diversity of use. So um, here again is just an overview and I'm going to go through the different sections. I, I give these slides so that if you're going to print out later, you can start thinking about how to organize your, um, your strategy and approach to LinkedIn. So let's move into job search. Um, and hopefully you can see this. I, I, I wanted to make them a bit smaller because obviously I want to limit the number of slides, but also um, have both of these ideas on here. So on the left side, what you see is a search. I did Technology Santa Fe, and this is what it looks like when you're doing a job search. So I have any time. So, so I put those search terms in. I have any time and there's a thousand jobs. Past 24 hours, it's it's 48. You can put locations, you can put the job type. And now look 
um, sorry, and all the bottom, you know, com you can search by company, by industry, by job function, and you can put alerts for each of these things. Um, I, I, sorry, you can put alerts for companies um, and, and some other alerts. The LinkedIn features, this is where LinkedIn really is better and different than other ways of job search. You see in your network, and then easy apply, and then under 10 applicants. Um, so you can decide that you want to apply for jobs that have very few applicants. Usually this is a proxy for the job is newly posted, um, or the job doesn't have a lot of people applying because you need very specific skills. Sometimes it means people aren't interested in the job, so you have to take it with a grain of salt, but it's certainly a helpful item to be able to search under. Um, and within your network, as you probably know, or if you don't, you should know, it's not enough just to apply for a job. The worst thing to do in a job search is to send out applications over and over and over again, to sit in front of your computer. You know, when we had, when I had this slide up earlier and the person circling the job, the want ads, right? And now it's, it's really interactive. You want to take advantage of that interactivity. Find out who you know at the company or who you can know, how you can get to them. That doesn't mean, um, when LinkedIn was first launched, they had this idea of you'd send to your first degree connection and ask them to connect to their first degree connection that you were a second degree connection to. And you know, you'd send these in-mails and the like. It's better to have a, a warm introduction, but to be asking to be introduced all the time isn't usually the best way to do it. Um, and to just kind of skip ahead to the networking a bit, people said they were very interested in that as well. Networking is best done when you provide value to your audience. So rather than just a transactional request, can you introduce me to so-and-so, um, which you can certainly do, but you want to go beyond that, right? Is there a way that you can add value? It might just be that you are showing an interest that you are saying that you've, you know, and, and this has to be genuine, right? It can't work just because I'm giving you words. I never want to give you a script. But if it's authentic, you know, that you're continuing to follow this person, that you you followed their career or read a lot of what they've written or whatever, and, and give a way to have a hook for someone to actually introduce you. Because for many professionals, it's a lot to ask. And I, I talk at different times um, in my writing and other places about the ask, having an appropriate ask, not too big and not too small. And I mean by what you're asking other people to do for you. For many professionals, it's a very big ask to say, I want you to introduce me to someone, take a risk that I'm going to actually present myself well. So you have to, you have to give them a reason to do that. But knowing all of that, having them in your network, that feature is, is a really helpful thing. And then if you go down to the, the corner on the right, the manager and, you know, so I happen to be in financial services and law um, in my previous roles. And so I have six connections and from my law school, 118 alumni who I assume are with Deloitte in general, not in Shanghai, but I can search through that. I can see where my connections are. Um, and if you're searching for a job in your industry, and you're making the right connections, you can find a way to um, hopefully get there. Sometimes it's dead ends, people don't know anyone or they're not willing to help you, but often this is a great way to help propel your job search. So um, I, I hope that you go through, you start to use LinkedIn to search. As I said, it will give you what they call credit, well, what I call credit in their algorithm, the machine learning piece. So if you're going to search for a job anyway, you may as well do it in LinkedIn. Again, you know, within certain parameters. If you are searching for two jobs that are completely different from each other, you don't want to confuse the algorithm. Um, you know, a, a musician and a baker, <laughs> or or a lawyer. Um, but but within those bounds, then I would say definitely try to use the. You know, if it's efficient and effective for you, right? That time optimization. Try to use the platform. Um, searching for jobs within the platform, you can check check boxes. Job, I'm sorry, check what they've suggested for you, jobs you may be interested, jobs in your network on the jobs page. You can get email alerts for job posts. Um, you can um, use the easy apply button. If you use the easy apply button, essentially they're using your LinkedIn profile like a mini resume. And if you've ever, um, if you a few years ago printed out, maybe it was even a year ago, printed out your PDF of your profile, it looked very different than it does now. 
since Microsoft bought LinkedIn, you may have noticed it's doing many, many changes. And one of the changes they're doing is they're trying to make it look more like a resume. Um, and so if you apply through Easy Apply, you want to make sure, not that your profile looks like a resume, but that you have all that relevant information that you would have on a resume so that they can actually see that you are, um, are the right applicant. Um, featured applicants on LinkedIn Premium, I put to be discussed here because there's a, there's a lot to say about it. Um, LinkedIn really pushes LinkedIn Premium. I don't want to say that it's not um, worth it. For some people, it really is. What it gives you is a lot more information or transparency about the application process. Um, for example, I have one candidate who has a foreign law degree and she realized that she wasn't getting credit for the law degree because it didn't say JD. And so she had to come up with how to account for that on her LinkedIn profile or think about whether she wanted to. Um, it shows you where you are in ranking to other applicants. Um, it also, they say, boosts you towards the top of the list so that when someone's looking for you, uh, sorry, when someone's doing a search, you know, if 100 candidates come out, you're you know, seven instead of whatever other number. And they don't release the, the data on that, of course. Um, but that's another way that LinkedIn Premium is, is sold as a package of, of why you might want it. Um, there's also the idea that if you're on LinkedIn Premium, if a recruiter is looking, they might, it, it again might be a signal that you're more open to job search. Not necessarily, and um, you know, it's, it's just another piece in the, in the puzzle, if you will. Um, network building connections and posts, we, we'll talk about this in other slides, but essentially that's all part of your job search and you should think about it as part of your job search. Researching companies and connections. So here's, again, a way to find your connections. You can go straight to the company page. This is Uber, and if you see on the right, um, I have you know, people I know who are hired here. I can see all the employees at LinkedIn. Um, so for example, if I click on all employees, it will sort for me. Generally, it sorts by your first degree connections and then your second degree connections and then your third degree connections if you have connections at the company. So it's a really useful way to see who you know there. Um, on the right, I've searched for University of Chicago, and here's our own Adam Sylvain, who came up as the first hit. Um, and so if you put in the name of a company, it, so on the left, I, I actually put in the name of the company and looked for um, companies. On the right, I, looked, I clicked the people, um, and then I can easily just see who is actually there. This is a slide, um, just a really quick, quick point about how your profile is viewed across different devices. So as you see on the left in the middle, very little of your summary comes through at the beginning. And you want to make sure that whatever people need to know about you, they don't have to click see more or load more because they probably won't unless they're interested in, in what's up at the beginning. Also, you want to think about how the banner, if you decide to use a banner, those are the, the books here with the black background. Um, if you have a banner, how it might look. So to look at your profile on different devices, see how that looks. Recruiters view. So I was just talking about the view when people see you. This is what recruiters may see when they're looking. So they did a, in, in this, um, and this is straight from LinkedIn. I, I just did a, uh, what's it called, a screenshot of their page. This is an example of what they might see. So they, they did a search with um, different job titles, uh, location, skills, companies, schools attended, possibly. Um, got 15,000 uh, 15, candidates. And then you see the open chain opportunities. Past applicants have company connections. There can be others. Um, and then this is what they see about you. They see your picture. So it's very important to have a picture. If not, you, know, you, you just may not be as interested sorry, it's interesting to the audience. Um, they see your name, they see your job title, um, where you are currently, et cetera. This is what they might see, which is very different, obviously, than this. So I want you to be thinking, again, about the, the different ways you can slice and dice LinkedIn, and, and other people are as well. I have a handout on this. Um, so I won't talk about it too much more, but I, I wanted to encourage you to think about the different pieces that go into your profile. Sometimes people are really focused on, I want to have a really good summary, and they forget about their headline. Or 
And number nine here, contact info, for example. And in my article, I talk about um, changing your LinkedIn profile URL to one that's actually nice looking. If you got on LinkedIn after you know the initial boom time of getting on, you will have a bunch of ugly numbers after your name. Your LinkedIn profile will say LinkedIn.com slash in slash, you know, Adam Sylvain, blah, 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 you know, like eight or ten different numbers after it. So if I want to forward your profile to someone else, there's no easy way for me to do it. It just it looks ugly. Um, if you want to post it on your resume, you can put a hyperlink. Um, but if you wanted to actually send the profile listing itself um, and, and, and make it pretty, I like to, when you have hyperlinks, they don't always work. So I like to actually put it on the resume, even if you include a hyperlink. So that way it, it's all cleaned up. And that's the same for everywhere else. You want to make sure it's cleaned up. You want to make sure your, your attachments are there, that they work. Um, as I say in the article, not having Twitter accounts that you don't use anymore, or you know, sometimes there's a private Twitter account if someone puts it on there. It's like, why? Why is that even there? It, it anything that can build, anything you do can build your credibility, or it can take it away. Um, it, people say, why? What, you know, why, why is it like this? So you want to, you want to not have that happen. You want to be building credibility all the time. Here is again something I wanted you to see really quick: public profile settings. So your public profile's visibility, you are required to put your name, your number of connections, your industry, and your region. You are not required to put all of this other information. Sorry, I have a cat here. Go away. I'm trying to do this at home because my dog has heartworm, and I'm home with him. So sorry about that interruption. Um, he's asleep on the floor. It's now the cat who's making all the noise. Sorry about that. So public profile settings, just wanted you to see, you, um, if you see it on the right-hand side, the public, you can make all of these things public or not. If you are editing your profile, you can certainly turn off all of these things or some of these things, but you continue to have your name, number of connections, industry, and region up there. And so therefore, if you're making changes to that, don't ever make changes that you're not sure about and you don't want anyone to see because they will see them. And it will come up not just to your network, but in a public public search. Um, about your headshot, you want to have a balancing of professional and welcoming. And here again, I just wanted to give you some examples. So obviously on the left, you, you don't want to be so you know casual, but you also on the right, and this is a former photograph of me, don't want to be stiff. You want to be smiling. Um, you want to make sure that People want to connect with you. It's not just which picture, in which picture do I look best? How does my nose look? How does my hair look? It's also really, I would say, if you're thinking about going in front of a client or going in front of the CEO or the board or a boss or your colleagues, whatever your audience is, that's how you want to look, how you want to present yourself that day. Oh, and don't cut people out of the picture. We can tell. Um, the one on the bottom, I have a lot of people I've re reviewed their profiles and they have that problem as well. Headline, job title, and skills give an extra weight in the LinkedIn algorithm. So when you think about where you're going to put your energies, these are places where you should really be um, focused on. Specifically, the job titles are something we often don't think about. Just putting vice president doesn't really get you anything. When someone's looking through your, your titles, they don't get a sense of you. And as you saw in the recruiting section, sometimes they'll just see your job titles and, and companies. So you want to give more information. So imagine someone scrolling through your profile. You, you might think, oh, they're going to read. If they read through, though, they'll see it. But, but people don't read through. That's not the nature of how people look um, online and, and on devices. So you want to give as much information as you can. Skills and endorsements. Um, so endorsements are something, you know, so there's a recommendation section um, part and then there's endorsements. Endorsements are basically kind of likes. Um, people say that they endorse you for something, a, a certain skill. A recommendation is much more powerful, much more important, where someone writes something about you and you can post it on your page. You essentially accept the recommendation. So there are 52,000, I think, skills on LinkedIn. This is obviously a, a, a definitely a curated list. It's based on certain fields. But I wanted to give you a sense of the range of different types of skills that can be up there. You know, everything from audit committee to Python to Spanish. 
um, loan portfolio analysis. GDPR is a, a privacy law that came into effect. Um, so what I suggest you do, I've got the link down at the bottom of the full directory. I don't suggest you go through 50,000 skills and try to find them. Um, there's two ways I would say to try to get good skills for you. One is, well, three. One is to go to your resume and say, well, what, what skills am I actually listing on my resume? It may not be that they're in the LinkedIn format of how to present skills, but if it follows something like what's on this slide, that they're short and sweet and, and um, well described, that's a good place to start. You can also go to other people's profiles and click on their skills section and see what they've got, if they are similar types of um, professionals to you. And in addition, if you do go into the directory and you start to learn how to navigate it a bit, there's a kind of a trick to it. So say we go with P&L. When you go into the page, so you're in the topics, you go down and search and they've got it, you know, They've got it where they've got acronyms at the top and then you keep going through and they've got different names and you have to pick different sections where you're deciding, I'm gonna look you know, from A to L kind of thing, but it's, it's, you know, it's more like AM, AML to AMS. Um, so you find P&L and then when you click on it and get into it in the directory, you can go find other skills that are related and you can continue to do that iteration over and over again and maybe come up with more skills for yourself. I wouldn't use redundant skills so like Ruby on Rails and Python, not redundant. But if you had two different ways to describe um, talent management, I wouldn't, maybe recruitment and talent management you would put, but I wouldn't put recruiting and recruitment, for example, or things like that that are, are essentially redundant. You're wasting the, the space. And um, you know it's not, it's not really adding anything to your profile. The LinkedIn summary. Why is it so hard to write a great profile? Um, a lot of it's just a block. Um, we just don't really know where to start to even write about ourselves. And sometimes we're not sure who our target audience is and what they're looking for. So I've given you some pieces here about the LinkedIn summary, thinking about your audience, thinking about your personal value prop and branding, what and how much to share, the narrative, and keywords, of course, are very important because often people use them to search for you. So I've got more in the handout on this. Um, I've got different types of ways that I've drafted my own summary in the past, just kind of get you started. I suggest you don't start with a blank sheet of paper. Try starting with some notes about yourself. I go into this a bit more here, how to write your LinkedIn profile. Start with thinking about, well, we start with trying to be more creative, be in the right headspace, but then start looking at what you've already created for yourself in the past. Figure out how you're going to structure it, and that's why I gave you some different options of how you could do things. Um, obviously, there, there are many more. Um, write what comes to you. You can look at other people's profiles to get ideas, and then obviously revise and send feed, uh, seek feedback. I want to talk a bit about straddling as well. And Adam graciously said I could put him into um, the mix of the different types of profiles. He's not straddling. Straddling is like when you have two different audiences, essentially, or you're looking for different types of roles, or you do different things. Adam's very happy where he is. Um, but he also brought, he brought in prior experience, and so that was important. Because he's not been in this field as long as someone who, who might have started there. So he wants to give himself credit and, and show others how he has these other skills that are both transferable and directly applicable to what he's doing now. Um, so many people have different types of audiences. Um, I've got some examples at the top. Um, it's hard to figure out safe versus dream rules. It's hard to figure out um, how to put these different pieces in. If people have specific questions about this, I know we'll be getting to the questions in a minute or two, so feel free to ask that and I can talk about it more. Um, and here are some examples of how you might think about how to address that sort of thing. Structuring it um, and tone and, and coming up with essentially your way of presenting this information. Here's about how LinkedIn networking works. Um, I, want, I just want to skip over these slides quickly because we, we, I don't want to run out of time and have, I want to have time for questions. But this is how when they talk about first, second and third degree connections if you're not familiar with that term. Activity as well, this is how you get into making a post. You can make a, a post or an article. 
Um, I would say that sharing original content, you don't have to be writing articles. You can just be sharing what other people have put up um, that you find relevant to your audience. Also, um, putting up your own posts that are engaging and timely, related to your professional um, experience and, and your value proposition that you've decided for yourself. And don't forget to continue to use LinkedIn even when you find a job. As I say at the bottom, LinkedIn can work for you, but only if you invest in making it work. Um, many times we forget about LinkedIn, we're in a job, and then come two years later or wherever we are in the cycle, we have to start all over again. It doesn't mean you need to be continually building your profile every day, but I would, I would calendar it for yourself, maybe every month or every quarter, to go back and make sure that it's current, that you're putting things up. Or if you are doing things um, periodically, like public speaking or publications, you just go add them as you're, as you're doing them. Or um, if you have the benefit of a, an administrative assistant, ask them to do that. Um, but essentially, find ways to keep yourself up to date online. So that's, that's my presentation, Adam. Feel free to let me know if any questions came in. Yeah, absolutely. We do have some, some questions in the queue and I encourage anybody uh, on the call to uh, continue submitting those questions and we'll get through uh, as many as we can with our remaining time. Um, since we did have a couple of questions uh, regarding the handouts, I do wanna just remind everyone that those handouts should be available in the handouts panel um, of the control panel. If you're having trouble finding or accessing them, for instance, if you're on a mobile phone, those handouts will also be shared in a in a folder that'll be uh, a shared folder that'll be included in the post event email today. So so don't be concerned if if you're having trouble accessing those at the moment. Um, they will all be shared there. Um, and just also as a reminder, uh, Anne, Anne Marie shared at the beginning that this is a hard topic to to cover in in just one hour. So. For those interested in, in doing a deeper dive into LinkedIn and looking at other opportunities to educate themselves, um, more information about that will be shared in the post-event email. And, and you're also encouraged to, to uh, explore uh, resources on, on Anne Marie's site as well. So all of that will be, will be shared in the post-event email. But, but let's get to some questions. So um, do you have a few here? Um, the, the first one, uh, have an attendee said their interest is in making their profile stand out as they look to serve on a corporate board. Can you speak to using LinkedIn for corporate boards? Right. Okay. So a couple of things. Um, I, and, and maybe this person can type into the chat box. I don't know if they're currently on a board or not. So I'm going to assume that probably they're not the way the question was phrased. Do we get an answer? Um, we'll see if, uh, if they respond. Um, I think your assumption is probably fair at the moment. Right. So, okay. So, you always want to make sure that your current you keep your current employer in mind, right? So assuming that your current employer is on board with this, not to make a pun, that they know you're going to be looking for a corporate board position, that they are not necessarily pushing you for it, but that it's not going to be a surprise. You, you again, you don't want to say open to new opportunities, but you can start to think about ways to show that um, that interest. And so when I work with clients, one of the things we talk about is how can you, it's not just an online thing, how can you demonstrate your interest in board? So one way might be that you get on an advisory board, for example, and then you put that on LinkedIn. Um, one, an, another thing to think about is that you, um, what are the skills that someone needs to go on to a corporate board? And make sure that your pro profile reflects that. In addition, you might say that you are, um, you might say that you're open to board positions as well, but you want to be careful how you phrase it um, so that you don't look, if you're a very, if you're very robust in your executive role, that would be fine to put that you're open to board positions. I wouldn't put it, um, that's the straddling piece. I wouldn't put it um, front and center. I would put it somewhere towards the bottom. Um, but, but essentially finding ways both um, explicitly and implicitly to show that you're a match for boards. Great, I will share that the, the that um, audience member did share that they are on advisory boards already, um, so they do have some board experience. Great, so I would put that both in um, either the organization section um, or put maybe some of the board positions as an actual role if you can group them together or individually depending on you know how many roles you have on your profile and you can put some reference to it a sentence in your summary 
Great. Um, next question: Is there a way to get metrics on what people look at or click on in your profile so that they so that you can optimize uh, the wording? What people look at, meaning different sections in the profile. I don't think you can get metrics on that. You can see who is looking at your profile, and I believe with the premium account there are ways to see. Um, essentially what search terms people are using. So there is that. Um, this is a question, a lot of questions that people have, one of the best ways to find the answers is to go to LinkedIn help. Um, I'm sorry, to get to LinkedIn help. And what you what you can do now, because Google is um, so, so well integrated, is to essentially put whatever your question is in, and put the word LinkedIn, and often LinkedIn help will come in first. So this type of question, I would probably direct to that. Um, I, I don't think that the actual answer is that they, you can figure out, you know, are you spending more time at the top or bottom or in looking at certain roles or that sort of thing. I, I don't think there's that level of transparency. Great, thank you. Um, uh, so uh, another question, this one uh, gets at something that might be, other people may have encountered as well. So, so within a few weeks of, of the, at the beginning of the month, they're getting a note that they've reached a limit. I think this is a, a limit on on maybe new new connections or viewing uh, profiles, and that this person doesn't understand how or why this is happening. Can you speak to this? Um, getting a note from LinkedIn that you've reached a, a limit, a search limit, um, and and how to I, navigate that. It's probably the commercial use limit is my assumption and essentially and, and it's it would be odd if it came at the beginning of every month but it may be that it seems like it's then or you know maybe something and I'm, I'm just not aware of all the details but if you are doing a lot of searches on people so um you've decided that you want to look for you know you want to network with people in tech in san francisco um in you know some some iteration of that or even just that broad but you're starting to look at more and more profiles doing searches clicking in and seeing people or just you know pulling up pages and pages and pages of candidates linkedin as much as it's useful as a free tool is really designed to um, at some point hook you into spending money i'm not saying you should do that but they do have these commercial use limits. And at some point, if you do too many searches, you get close to that and then they cut you off and, and won't let you search. So I assume that's what's going on. Great, thank you. Um, we have a few people that, that are asking for clarification around um, whether it is wise to attach a, a PDF of your resume to your profile. Can you speak more to that? Good question. I, I would say absolutely not. I, I would not attach a resume to my profile. Um, quickly, some of the reasons are there are <laughs> people are going to steal your information. Um, you shouldn't have your home address on your resume anyway, but you certainly shouldn't have it on LinkedIn. Um, you also may not want your phone number on LinkedIn. Um, you, when you send your resume out, will probably target it to different audiences. If you put it on LinkedIn, you're only having one resume there. And so you don't want to have that. Um, lose that inability to have your resume look different for different contexts. If you come to an interview and you have a different resume than the one you had posted on LinkedIn, um, it's it's again going to have some put some uncertainty possibly at well, oh, they they emphasize these certain skills, but now there's these other skills. I realize that LinkedIn itself um, doesn't allow you to have different views for different audiences. However, you are not bound by two pages, or as for a junior person, maybe one page, like you are with a resume. You can put so much more information. And the summary section is very unique. It's 2,000 characters max, which is much more than a summary section you would likely have in a resume. So you can be multifaceted in a way that you can't with the resume posted. Great. Um, as a as a follow up to that, what would be some good things to because you do have that option to attach uh, files mm -hmm. to your profile? Um, what would be some better uses of that function if if you do suggest taking advantage of that? Um, you could put if certainly if you have been interviewed by the media, if you've been um, in a publication um, or or written a publication, as long as it's recent enough or relevant to what you're doing now, um, if you um, have some kind of a project that you want to put up there. And again, you have to make sure that, think about the audience, they've never seen it before. I've looked at people's profiles where they have something up and you know, it not only is it dated, but 
it's a school project or something, which is great in some ways, but I can't tell what it is or why I should care. Um, so you want to make sure you use that standard always. Um, sometimes people put a link to the website if they are featured on a company website. You have to be careful with links because um, for one thing, if you change jobs, you want to make sure to, to change that because the, the link won't be active anymore. But also sometimes people um, share information, I'm sorry, change websites and, and you don't know it so that you, you want to run through it every once in a while and make sure it's still current. There's one other time where you might really want to use it. I have a candidate, for example, who was from the Midwest and now he's in the Southeast. And um, he's looking for a job back in the Midwest. And he happens to be a big sports fan and he was, you know, put on the news with his kids um, with a sport sporting event and he put that up as an attachment to kind of show a bit more his engagement with um, the place where he's from. So that's another way to use it. Great. I think we have maybe time for, for two more questions and, and there are several um, attendees who are interested in this uh, kind of straddling concept and um, so we have one question that uh, what would be your advice on writing your header or summary if you currently have one job in the energy sector, but you want to switch sectors um, to mm -hmm. education, uh, kind of without upsetting your current employer, so being being aware of, of the optics of that? Um, any advice there? Right, right. And so that's part of why I, I attach this attorneys or LinkedIn headline in 120 characters or less. Mm -hmm. Obviously, many people on the call are not attorneys. But if you go through it, you can see a lot of different options. And one of them, you know, we have attorney novelist, for example, um, which is is different. So I bring this up because a novelist or you know a writer isn't incompatible with your current job, where education and energy probably isn't compatible, right? Because it's it probably means you'd have to leave your current role in order to do it. So the first thing you want to think about is is there a way to express it? so that it's not incompatible, that it looks like an extension of what you're doing. Um, and, and I don't know what you do in your job, if you do training, if you do presentations or that sort of thing, probably even then it wouldn't rise to the level of putting it in your headline, but you could find a way to mention education in your summary section, again, not at the top, somewhere you know, two thirds or three quarters of the way down, um, and it doesn't have to be the very last bit, um, you can sum up again with something in energy, but to be using those keywords so that you're found. Um, if you are on a board that is related to education, if you're doing some kind of volunteer work that's related to education, for example. Also, if you're getting certifications in the new field, you, you could probably put those in as well and then put a description so you get some more keywords and that's probably how I'd approach it. Great, um, we have a last question which may be relevant again to, to several members on the call, but if if uh, somebody is not currently employed, uh, what do you advise them to say or to include in their headline or, or keyword section? Right, okay, and that's that's referenced in the article as well, but I'll speak to that um, here. So if you are a project manager, if you are an engineer, um, if you are a teacher, whatever you are, you are still that even if you're unemployed. And so there's no reason that you can't put that on your profile. Um, I would suggest that you don't just put teacher or engineer, that you find other things that you can um, put on there to describe yourself. Um, and again, the article might be helpful in that regard. Um, when you talk about your summary, sorry, when you draft your summary, I encourage you to use the first sentence to talk about you, not where you're working, regardless of whether you have a job or not. Because you're, you're not the sum of your job, you are who you are. So I would do the same thing if you're unemployed. You can then be putting previously. Previously, I was with such and such place. Obviously not was, try to use a better verb. Um, but talking about it that way. So you don't have a loss of identity and you still have value to add whether or not you're employed and you want recruiters to see you that way. And then you might also find a way, and, and this is tricky and there's a lot of subtlety here, but to find a way to have a current position because sometimes people want to search for someone who's currently employed and if you have a placeholder there that's more a bit more than a fig leaf but has something, you know, and, and thinking about your individual situation, that also might be a helpful piece to add. 
Great. Well, thank you so much, um, Anne-Marie, and thank you to everyone for, for attending today's webinar. A reminder, um, Anne-Marie mentioned several times during the presentation and in her responses that there are several handouts. Uh, if you have not had a chance to, to download those um, from within the GoToWebinar platform, again, I'll make sure that those are shared in the post-event email. Um, so thank you again, Anne-Marie, for sharing this wealth of information on LinkedIn and, and how to leverage uh, that platform effectively. I want to remind everyone that our, our programming continues on Monday, March 25th at 12 p.m. Uh, we're going to be hosting a UChicago Connect alumni LinkedIn review. So this is a great kind of follow up to today's webinar. Um, and for those of you who will be kind of workshopping your, your LinkedIn profile over the next uh, week or so, uh, this program on the 25th is an opportunity to have your LinkedIn profile reviewed by an alumni professional. So, um, so please consider that opportunity. And then on Wednesday, March 27th, we'll host a webinar titled Intellectual Property for Non-Lawyers, IP Strategy to Improve ROI and Maximize Profits. Understanding intellectual property has far-reaching consequences for professionals in a wide variety of industries, so I encourage you to consider joining us for that webinar as well. And please visit our events page at careers.uchicagoalumni.org for the most up-to-date schedule of events. Take care, everyone, and, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.